Welcome. In this video, we'll explore neuromorphic computing, circuits that mimic how the brain thinks. They offer a radically different path from traditional computers and could transform the future of AI and robotics. Traditional computers excel at structured tasks, but they hit limits when it comes to real-time thinking, like recognizing a voice or learning from experience. Their structure causes constant data shuffling between processor and memory, leading to speed and energy issues. Let's talk about the von Neumann architecture that it's based on a clear separation between the CPU and memory. While this was revolutionary at the time, it comes with some serious limitations today. First, there's the von Neumann bottleneck. Constant data transfers between memory and CPU create delays and reduce overall speed. Second, it's power hungry. This architecture wasn't designed for tasks like learning or perception, which are key in modern AI systems. And finally, it struggles with parallel tasks. It processes information step by step in a serial fashion, making it inefficient for things that require multitasking or simultaneous processing. Now let's look at how the brain works and why it's so different from traditional computers. The human brain has around 86 billion neurons, and each one connects to thousands of others. That's an enormous, complex web of communication. Neurons communicate using electrical spikes, sending signals across these connections in real time. What's truly amazing is that, unlike in computers, memory and processing happen in the same place in the brain. And what does that give us? It results in extreme parallelism. So, what is neuromorphic computing? It's a new approach to computing, inspired by how the brain works, especially its neural networks. Instead of traditional logic gates, it uses spiking neurons and synapses just like in the brain. The key difference is that it processes information locally and in parallel, which means it's much more efficient for tasks like pattern recognition, perception, and learning. You can see, this is shown in the three circles in the video. Neuromorphic computing tries to build hardware that works like the brain. Instead of regular logic gates, it uses spiking neural networks tiny circuits that only activate when they receive a signal. That means less wasted energy and faster response. The key idea? Computing and memory happen at the same place, just like in a real brain. Chips like Intel's Loihi or IBM's TrueNorth use this brain-inspired approach. They don't run like a normal computer. They spike, adapt, and learn. Here is a table that highlights the key differences between traditional computing and neuromorphic computing. Let's walk through each one to understand how they compare. Let's start with the data format. Traditional computing uses binary signals, just zeros and ones, to represent all types of information. Neuromorphic computing, on the other hand, mimics the brain's behavior by using spikes, short bursts of electrical activity. These are event-driven, meaning they only occur when something important happens, making the system much more dynamic and efficient. Next, memory and computation. In traditional systems, memory and processing are separated. The CPU constantly fetches data from memory, which leads to delays and higher energy use. Neuromorphic systems integrate memory and compute, just like the brain does. Neurons store and process information in the same place, which allows for faster and more efficient computing. Now let's look at how operations are handled. Traditional computers work in a sequential, clock-driven manner. Every operation happens step by step, controlled by a timing signal. Neuromorphic computing is parallel and event-driven. It responds in real time to what's happening just like our brain reacts to a sudden sound or movement. And finally, energy use. Traditional computing can be very power-hungry, especially with complex tasks, 
Neuromorphic systems aim to match the brain's ultra-low power efficiency, often using just a few watts, making them ideal for energy-sensitive applications like mobile AI or robotics. So, to sum it up, neuromorphic computing isn't just a new kind of hardware. It's a complete shift in how we approach computation. By mimicking the brain, it brings us closer to building machines that can think, adapt, and learn like humans. So, if neuromorphic computing is so promising, why aren't we using it everywhere? First, the hardware itself is complex to fabricate. Unlike traditional chips, neuromorphic hardware needs entirely new materials and architectures, which are still being developed and tested. Second, the software ecosystem isn't ready yet. We can't just run existing programs on neuromorphic chips. They require new algorithms and even new programming languages. That's a huge barrier for developers and researchers. Third, there's a lack of standards. Every company or lab working on neuromorphic tech is doing it differently. And that makes it harder to collaborate, compare results, or scale solutions. And finally, neuromorphic systems aren't compatible with existing CPUs or GPUs. That means they can't just slot into today's computers. It would require major redesigns in both hardware and software stacks. In short, we're still in the early days. The technology is promising, but it's not yet practical for widespread use. Let's look at the mathematics behind how neuromorphic neurons behave. The most basic model is called the integrate and fire neuron. Here's the formula that governs it. Let's break it down piece by piece. V of T is the membrane potential, the electrical state of the neuron at time T. V of rest is the resting potential, the baseline voltage when nothing is happening. I of T is the input current at time T. R of M is the membrane resistance which scales how strongly input affects the voltage. Tau M is the membrane time constant, showing how quickly the neuron reacts over time. This differential equation models how the neuron integrates input over time. The potential V of T builds up as current comes in, but if it gets too far from the resting state, it wants to return, like a spring pulling back to its natural position. Now comes the key part, when the voltage V of T reaches a certain threshold, V of TH the neuron fires a spike, an electrical pulse. Immediately after V of T resets back to the resting value V of rest. Now let's compare spiking neural networks, or SNNs, with the more familiar traditional neural networks that power most of today's AI. First, SNNs use discrete spikes, short bursts of activity, instead of continuous activation values like ReLU or sigmoid. That means neurons only communicate when something meaningful happens, just like in our brains. Second, SNNs encode information not just in the value of the signal, but in the timing of the spikes. This adds a whole new dimension, temporal dynamics, how things change over time. Third, SNNs are event-driven, not clock-driven. Traditional networks process data in fixed time steps, like frames in a video. But SNNs respond only when there's input, just like your eye responding to movement. This makes them far more efficient. And finally, the pros. SNNs are much more energy efficient and are closer to how real biological brains operate. They're ideal for tasks that need low power fast response, and adaptability, like robotics, edge AI, and brain-machine interfaces. So, while traditional neural nets dominate AI today, spiking networks offer a glimpse into the next frontier, AI that thinks more like us. So according to my explaining about SNNs and NNs, let's take a closer look at the diagram, specifically diagrams A, B, and D and how they changes and simulate.
Let's explore how learning happens in spiking neural networks. The key idea is synaptic plasticity, where the strength of connections, the synaptic weights, change over time based on experience. The most widely used rule is called SDDP, spike timing dependent plasticity that it's based on the timing difference between when two neurons fire. Here, delta T equals T of post minus T of pre, meaning how much later the post neuron fires after the pre neuron. This rule governs how synapses strengthen or weaken. If a presynaptic spike arrives just before a post spike, the connection strengthens. If the timing is off, the connection weakens. This allows learning without needing gradient descent or huge training data sets. If the preneuron fires just before the postneuron, delta T bigger than zero, the connection is strengthened, the weight increases. If the postneuron fires before the preneuron, delta T less than zero, the connection is weakened, the weight decreases. Look at the SDDP diagram. The real part is like a sharp unit function, growing and decaying across a narrow window. But the complex part is more interesting. It spans from plus one to minus one and looks like a rippling ramp that decays, capturing the oscillatory and decaying nature of real biological learning signals. So what can neuromorphic chips actually do? They're already being tested in. Robots that can balance and walk on tricky terrain. Drones that can fly and make decisions on their own. And because they use less power, they're perfect for edge computing. Smart devices that think on their own without needing the cloud. This might sound futuristic, but it's real and it matters. Imagine devices that can learn, adapt, and make decisions all while using a tiny battery. That means smarter wearables, smarter cars, smarter everything. Neuromorphic computing brings us closer to true AI, the kind that doesn't just follow code, but understands patterns like we do. If you found this video helpful or thought-provoking, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to Danish Academy for more deep tech breakdowns. Made simple, and if you have any questions, drop it in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.